Well, guys, I certainly hope you enjoyed this year's Sonic Hacking Contest, but now it's time to get a little more official. It's been some time since I dedicated a bunch of videos to Sonic. Last time I gave his jump to 3D to the comb over, and I'm pretty damn happy how those turned out. To this day, they remain some of my most watched videos on this channel, even the 50 plus minute behemoth known as my Sonic 06 review. Clearly, it's you people that have the problem. When I started dropping hints that I had intentions of going back to the Sonic series for a marathon, I was taken aback by the number of people that wondered what was left. Oh, there are plenty of other things to talk about. I'm talking handheld stuff, among other things, which since Sonic's inception back in 1991 has seen just as much action as the blue blur has seen on consoles. Hell, probably even more action. I guess we'll find out throughout this marathon. For the first video of this new Sonic Marathon, I wanted to dedicate it to the two games that shared their names with their console counterparts, Sonic 1 and Sonic 2. The first two handheld Sonic games ever created. I know Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis is technically a handheld variant of its console counterpart, but fuck you. Sega was damn aggressive in marketing in the 90s, and their first, and to my knowledge, only handheld, was pushed as the more mature option compared to the Game Boy. It was the size of a fucking football and required six AA batteries, but it had a backlit screen so you could see what was going on no matter where you play, which was, you know, to its credit, a feature ahead of its time for a handheld gaming device. I think the only thing that was comparable at the time was the Atari Lynx, but like the Atari Lynx, that meant fuck off for sales. The Game Boy massacred the poor thing in numbers, and it was clear to the audience that Sega was more interested in pushing console sales, so a lot of people simply didn't bother. But declining numbers or not, that didn't stop Sega from releasing several Sonic titles for the thing in the number of years the Game Gear lasted, and these two laid the foundation for what was the beginning of Sonic's healthy, portable stint. Now, I'm throwing around the term handheld a whole lot, but... Maybe this is a bit of a shock to you, but the 8-bit renditions of Sonic 1 and 2 were originally, if just for a few months, console games. When folks are discussing the 8-bit Sonic 1 and 2, they're most likely talking about the Game Gear versions, since the handheld was being so heavily pushed by Sega when it came out, and because the Game Gear games today are so widely available on a select number of Sonic collections, like Mega Collection Plus or Gems Collection or Sonic Adventure DX. But 8-bit Sonic 1 and 2 technically debuted somewhere else. The Sega Master System, perhaps you've heard of it? It was Sega's home console unit in the mid to late 80s before the Genesis swooped in and took over. And despite the Genesis already being about two to three years into its lifespan by 1991, Sega thought it appropriate to give the Master System a slice of the hedgehog solely responsible for shattering any future Alex K could hope to see. Can I start with, I hate the Master System box art. Was it too much to hire some freelance artists out there at the time? Grid lines, basic as fuck text, and MS Paint Doodle. I made this sort of shit when I was in kindergarten. At least Sonic 1 and 2 weren't neglected. These aren't bad at all, but then again, I always appreciated the Japanese box art of the original Sonic games. It was the commercials I never really <sighs> agreed upon. You can get the Master System versions of Sonic 1 and 2 on the Wii Virtual Console nowadays, so let's jump right into these and see if they're still worth your time and get this marathon started. 8-Bit Sonic 1. I don't have much memories with this one, I didn't grow up with it. That honor belongs to Sonic 2 more so, but one step at a time here. The plot's the same as the Genesis title, so we have our lovable Speedy the Hedgehog traveling across South Island to rescue all the woodland creatures under the tyrannical rule of Dr. Ivo Robotnik. There's about six zones in total, each of them containing three stages of piece, all ending with a direct confrontation with the Mad Doctor himself. Things start familiar with the classic Green Hill Zone. The trees, the flowers- OH LOOK AT THE LITTLE MOTOBUGS! Wow, I don't know why they're so incredibly tiny in this version, but they're so adorable! Look at that thing! That thing can't hurt me! Yes it can! Anyway, as I was saying, things look familiar at first, but 8-bit Sonic 1 only borrows around half of 16-bit Sonic's iconic levels, the others being Labyrinth Zone because we just had to make a handheld version of that godforsaken slog, and Scrap Brain Zone, a far cry compared to the Genesis game. It's night and day, this this one is not a challenge to finish at all compared to the Genesis Scrap Brain, which one at you dead every waking second. The other half of this Sonic 1 is comprised of entirely new level tropes. First there is Bridge Zone, a vivid mountaintop with collapsible bridges, catchy music, and home to the most anti Sonic the Hedgehog gimmick to ever grace the blue blur, auto-scrolling. Auto-scrolling. In a Sonic game, what in the actual fu- I can't process all this blast. What's the point of making this guy the physical manifestation of cocaine and then taking that away from me? Seriously, this is like anti-Sonic 101. All right, I'll move on. There's the luscious jungle zone containing some of the tightest platform you'll probably ever do with classic Sonic. I haven't gotten to the other games in the marathon yet, but I feel it's a safe assumption. Oh great, the fucking place has Contra Syndrome where everything below Sonic is suddenly a bottomless pit. What the fuck? I was touching the goddamn grass. All right then, the last of the unique zones is Sky Base Zone, which follows Scrap Brain, a fitting 
interesting stage for the final confrontation with Robotnik, even if it does remind me a little too much of Super Mario Bros. 3 at times. I don't think this game is uh, particularly hard altogether. I question the hitbox of Sonic occasionally, but I didn't come close to squeezing my controller too hard during my playthroughs, even though this game has a few quirks I don't find pleasing. At full speed, Sonic's just a little too far to the right of the screen for me. Enemy placement wasn't very dickish from what I've experienced, but pits and spike traps, I don't have as much time to react to them as I'd get from the Genesis games, so it's a little awkward. Also, not a fan of how Sonic can't pick up his fallen rings when he takes damage. That shit's a death sentence in a bed of spikes, and it's such a classic staple of Sonic games, right? You take a hit, you scramble to pick up as many rings as you can to defend yourself, but that simply doesn't work here. It's so jarring. You know what else I noticed? There's no loops in this game. Talk about another classic element not present here. I mean, what's a Sonic game without shuttle loops? They were part of the reason why Genesis games were so thrilling to go fast in. So let the game's physics engine just go to town and blaze away. Actually, while we're on the uh, subject of physics, which is the game's controls in general, Sonic still has some natural flow to his movements, though it's slightly more stilted compared to Genesis Sonic. He'll still pick up a shitload of speed when rolling down slope. Just look at him go right here. I mean, goddamn. If anything, this sort of Sonic works in this game, where the level design is more rudimentary. Mario, you could say. With just a slightly faster pace, except in Bridge Zone because you know why. There's some alternate pathways sprinkled here and there, and the reward is usually an extra life. You won't find much else besides a ring box or a shield for protection, invincibility, though at times it could also be a chaos emerald. Yeah, you don't play special stages to get these here, you just find them lying on the ground. Now, special stages are in this game regardless, but they're mainly for scoring more lives to continue should you happen to get a game over. And like the original Sonic 1, there's only six chaos emeralds here, and they don't mean anything besides a higher score, so go for them if you want the bigger numbers, but they're worthless in every other sense of the word. A few months later 8-bit Sonic landed on the Game Gear, and for the most part it's the same game. There were a few things tweaked for the better though. The sudden bottomless pit bullshit in Jungle Zone is gone, and some level design was altered in different zones to be less punishing. I'm guessing Sonic Team took the extra time, however small, to polish some assets. But because we're talking about a console going onto a handheld, you know what that means. We got a smaller screen resolution, which means screen crunch, and there's a lot of that here. But it's not the end of the world to be honest. Maybe it's because, again, the level structure of these stages is already more basic than a standard Sonic game, so going too fast isn't exactly a bad idea, but some zones do not benefit from the smaller screen. Green Hill is pretty bad with it, and Jungle Zone, I mean, my god, I hope there's something below me to land on. It wouldn't hurt if you just put a few extra rings here and there to help guide me. On the other hand, poor Robotnik, the smaller screen makes most, if not all, boss battles against the Doctor a total fucking cakewalk, and I'm talking easier than the Emerald Hill battle, and that's fucking sad. The game looks and sounds about the same as the Master System version, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the Game Gear was just a portable Master System, just like how the Nomad was a portable Genesis. But Sonic kind of took a hit in sprite quality in this version. Where's his goddamn nose? That shit is just gone. You ever see a Sonic without his nose? It's like Mario without his mustache. It's unnatural and needs to die immediately. Well, all in all, 8-bit Sonic 1 is not a bad game. It's short as fuck. You can finish it in less than an hour. Kind of goes without saying for platformers of this time. And I find it refreshing that it's not just trying to squeeze 16-bit Sonic into inferior hardware. It may borrow a few zones from the Genesis game, and some ideas don't mesh well with me, but over half of it is still original, and it's struck Truly sound. Between the two versions, I recommend the Master System for the larger screen, but I also recommend the Game Gear version for the slightly added polish. Do either of them compare to the original Sonic 1 to me? No, but I don't feel like my time was wasted, and I think that's important. You know, I don't like when I have to finish a game out of obligation for a video, because that means I wasn't enjoying myself, but I didn't feel that way here. Now, this game, on the other hand, oh god. 8-Bit Sonic 2. This is in fact one of the first Sonic games I ever played. As a kid, I played a fuck ton of Sonic 2 on the Genesis, and I'm still playing the hell out of it today if it wasn't obvious enough. It's a quintessential platformer to me. The design, the pace, the look, the sound, it's got all that with only Sonic 3 beating it in my opinion. To this day, one of the fondest memories of my early video game adventuring is finally beating the Death Egg robot at the age of 8. I love you, Sonic 2, I really do. When I was exposed to the Game Gear shortly thereafter in mid-90s, and when I learned there was a Sonic 2 for that handheld, I jumped right on that son of a bitch. Fun fact, 8-Bit Sonic 2 was both a Master System and Game Gear title, but only Europeans got the Master System version at first. Americans only had the Game Gear version for the longest time until both versions were made available by the late 2000s. And in actuality, the Master System Sonic 2 predates the Genesis Sonic 2 by a whole month, so this is technically the first game to introduce Sonic's lovable two-tailed mutant sidekick, Miles Tails Prower. And it's not a welcoming debut for the little fox, as the plot of 8-Bit Sonic 2 kicks off with Tails being kidnapped by 
Dr. Robotnik. In exchange for his safety, Dr. Robotnik demands the six Chaos Emeralds, so Sonic wastes little time hightailing it across several different zones, wondering why his kidnapped buddy appears in all the title cards despite his predicament, and he makes it his mission to collect all the Chaos Emeralds as he progresses in dealing with Dr. Robotnik's newest creations. The fact that Robotnik is demanding the Chaos Emeralds while simultaneously trying to kill Sonic is puzzling to say the least, and I'm surprised Robotnik didn't just immediately convert Tails into a robot slave from the get-go, but whatever, 8-bit storytelling I suppose in my young mind certainly didn't have time for logic back then. Now I got memories of this one, and I don't remember much of my first playthrough, but a few keywords always pop into my head immediately when I'm thinking about it, and that's Chaos Emeralds, Tails, Death, and Hang Glider. Shall we start from the top? Chaos Emeralds are uh, sort of a big deal in this game, and as previously, they're just found in set locations of the zone and don't require a special stage to collect. In fact, Sonic 2 doesn't have special stages at all, or a shield power-up, or a spin dash, or checkpoints now that I think about it. What's up with that? It's got loops, but that's sort of an uneven trade-off, wouldn't you say? But in contrast to the game before, the Chaos Emeralds are trickier to claim here, as early as the first zone, you gotta fight tooth and nail to stay on top of the stage just to get to the Emerald, and that requires some tight fucking one and done jumps. And they're not all a hassle to get, it's just those select few that hit you directly in the knees. Sky High Zone, seriously, where the fuck am I going here? There's some clouds I need to bounce off of to reach the damn Emerald, and not to sound racist, but they all look the damn same. If you don't get all six Chaos Emeralds before reaching this Silver Sonic knockoff, you can't reach the true final zone of this game, one of the earliest, but certainly not the last instance, where the finale is locked behind the Chaos Emeralds, which leads me into my second trigger word, Tails. The thing I remember the most about 8-Bit Sonic 2 is the fate of my buddy old pal old little fox boy if I didn't grab all the emeralds. You don't get the final stage, and the game just suddenly ends with Sonic running off into the night, only stopping to stare at the night sky with a distant memory of Tails looming over him. Oh my god, did Tails... die? Uh, oh shit! Oh shit! My player too! My meat shield! My wingman! No, really, he drove my fucking plane! Oh god, he's dead! Oh, I fucked up! As a kid, I was fucking mortified. I played so much Genesis Sonic 2, where Tails was always by my side. He'd get me into trouble on occasion. Okay, a lot. Stop that. But he had my back. He could score some extra hits. He rescues me after I destroy the death egg! I mean, what a guy! And I fucking failed him, oh Jesus! I felt like utter shit after seeing that the first time as a kid. And, you know, it's, it's merely implication. But but, you know, I was young. I filled in the blanks, and that's all I needed to do. But then, as I got older, occasionally going back to this here and there, I think I began to see the real reason why I don't have many fond memories of 8-Bit Sonic 2. This game is fucking hard for the wrong reason. That reason being, of course, the goddamn screen crunch. How they thought this game was okay to play like this is a fucking riddle. This Sonic 2 is certainly faster and closer to a classic Sonic game in terms of pacing, design, and control, but that only means with this small-ass resolution, the amount of times you run into an enemy or fall on some spikes or make a leap of faith or make a leap of faith or make a goddamn fucking leap of faith is frankly obnoxious. And by end game, there's a little too much trial and error, and I'm talking the bad kind where your reward for not knowing what's up ahead, even on your first playthrough, is a bet of spikes. Which leads me into trigger word number three, death. Simply put, you die a lot because of that shit. Not complicated at all. As for the fourth trigger, the hang glider. It fucking sucks. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. It just blows. Like the wind, which doesn't carry you far at all. There I go again, falling to my doom. But to be fair, the hang glider is only a thing you must deal with in the second zone of the game. And additional brownie points to Sonic 2. Every zone here is unique to this game. You won't find any brawled aesthetics from 16-bit Sonic 2, the only exception being Green Hills Zone. Not Green Hill Zone, Green Hills Zone. The S makes all the difference, apparently. And there's something to each zone that gives them their own identity for better or worse, mind you. The minecarts in the underground zone, the hang glider in sky high zone, the water skipping in tube section in aqua lake, the screen crunch in green hills, the fucking screen crunch in green hills, the gravity drums in gimmick mountain, and these asshole tubes in scrambled egg zone. This game is short, but pretty fucking testicle kicking all the same, and I deeply recommend if you feel you must play this, go after the master system version. It has a higher resolution, and you'd be surprised how much that mitigates shit. I mean, there's still the damn hang glider in scrambled egg zone with all this crazy and wacky tube fuckery but I can actually see more than three centimeters ahead of me. I can act appropriately, I can react appropriately. The bosses are no problem. I can get the Chaos Emeralds easily here. I can reach the final zone, which is confusingly easier than the zone before. This game is only now taking pity on me. Sonic 2 on the Master System is all right, despite the absence of some classic elements. But most importantly, I can rescue my buddy Tails here, and that feels good. Good to have you back, bud. I'm gonna teach you how to defend your ass next time. How do you feel about explosive devices? And there you have it, the beginning of Sonic's handheld career. Not bad altogether, and until we leave the game 
Game Gear scene, I'll stress again that the best way to experience these, if you feel you want to spend the time on them at all, is to purchase one of these Sonic Mega collections. It's just the best way to go about them, the smart thing to do. And you get so many options to choose from at a budgeted price. So next up in the marathon is what I like to call the Sonic and Tails duology. In Japan, they're known as Sonic and Tails 1 and 2 respectively, uh, but we over here know them as Sonic Chaos and Sonic Triple Trouble. So tune in next time to see if they're worth our time at all. I'm sort of heading into these as a newbie. I've dabbled into them a long time ago, but now I finally have an excuse to finish them. So what will I think? Well, we'll find out next time. With all that said, thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care. Did the hand motion a little late there on that send off, but fuck it, whatever. I'm already fading the black. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I did it again. Mm.